Uh, uh, okay, so I'm sorry I was muted. Uh, so is the presentation visible? Yes, it is. Oh, so, uh, so uh, my name is Jay and I'll be presenting uh, uh, modules 141 uh, to 145. Uh, and so uh, there'll be a minor hitch because some of the slides from my last module uh, did not get saved. So at that point, I'll write the stuff what is needed. So uh, yeah, so uh, lecture 141 was about affine space partition. So we saw this example in the lecture uh, one uh, lecture module 140, uh, where we were given the program on the left hand side, uh, and uh, we transformed this program. Uh, I mean, the left hand side program was not uh, embarrassingly parallel from the start, but uh, when we uh, uh, drew the iteration space and uh, all the dependencies, we found that uh, there are dependency chains that are independent of each other. So that's why we were able to transform it to uh, the program on the right hand side. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, for that program, the outer loop is data parallel, uh, but the inner loop is not data parallel. So, uh, I mean, uh, so the data dependencies, uh, uh, I mean, exist across the different iterations of the first two, but still it was able, uh, we were able to uh, transform it into an, uh, a program uh, by uh, transforming its axis uh, to exploit a uh, synchronization free parallelization. And uh, uh, now the iterations of the out outer loop in the second program can be done in parallel. And why is that possible? Because there are no data dependencies across different values of k. Uh, and uh, we'll see how we'll check that. But uh, upon doing this transformation, we uh, also increase the locality because. Uh, uh, because we, uh, I mean, we bring all the accesses that uh, you know access these uh, same values to uh, more closer. That's why we uh, increase the locality by doing the transformation. So now, how do we check that uh, uh, that there, there are no data dependencies across different values of k? So uh, yeah, so the, the loop uh, mentioned, uh, I mean, the inner loop cannot be parallelized, but the outer loop can be done in parallel. So uh, we'll set up some data dependence constraints. So uh, the constraints are as follows. So uh, so uh, so uh, there will be uh, two constraints for uh, the iteration space. So if I have, uh, I want to check if uh, uh, there exists some iterations i and i prime uh, such that uh, they access the same uh, memory location. And the uh, that uh, we also have an uh, uh, additional constraint here that k should not be able to uh, it should not be equal to k prime. Because we are checking that uh, we are checking data dependencies for different iterations for different values of k. Uh, so the first two equations are just the iteration space equation, and uh, uh, for the given pair of static accesses, uh, uh, I mean this constraint just says that uh, uh, that those iterations access the same value. And if this if these constraints yield no solution, then there is no data data dependence across different values of k for the for the given pair of static accesses. And we need to check this for all possible pair of status accesses uh, where data dependence is possible. And this also includes self pairings. So in the previous loop, uh, uh, I need to check it for uh, I need to check it for uh, a k minus uh, this axis a k minus l uh, comma l with itself as well. Yeah. Uh, and uh, if the given conditions are satisfied, we say that uh, this loop has uh, a de uh, one degree of parallelism because one level of loopness can be parallelized. Uh, and in general, uh, a loop list has a k degrees of parallelism if it has within the nest k parallelizable for loop. So uh, in that case, we can create order into the par k par parallel virtual processors. Uh, so uh, so in this given example. Uh, so it's it's a three loop and uh, three loop uh, depth net, and uh, we can see that for uh, the first two loops are uh, parallelizable because for uh, for different values of i and j for this uh, different values of the tuple, we we do not have any dependency in the loop. But for uh, but we have dependencies uh, for 
uh, different values of k so uh, so now we can uh, parallelize uh, both of these outer loops and uh, that's why we have two degrees of parallelism in this example so uh, so in general uh, let's say the iteration space is a l dimensional iteration space and the processor space is a k dimensional right, uh, processor space where k is the uh, uh, degree of parallelism so uh, now we want to create a mapping from the iteration space to the processor space because we want to uh, uh, map each iteration to the processor it is assigned to so uh, now we say that this mapping would be a many to one mapping because l would be greater than or equal to k always and it is a function so which means that it maps all the iterations so that is why it has to be a many to one mapping and uh, we need to use as many as virtual processes as possible so uh, now uh, once this mapping is done we'll have uh, partitions in the processor space uh, in the iteration space which basically says that uh, all the iterations uh, in that partition are mapped to the same processor they are assigned to the same processor which means that the same processor will execute all of those iterations so now the constraint that we put is that uh, this map that we want to find should be an affine function uh, i mean uh, the this is uh it's just a constraint that we're putting from our side and uh, this does not have this is, does not have to uh, this uh this is not necessary uh but is it just makes a uh, uh, analysis easier uh and uh, uh yeah and and we need to use uh, as many as processors as possible so uh and uh, in this example uh, with, uh, a simple uh, one loop uh, a for loop and it has uh, two assignments uh, a i equals 0 and b i equals 1 so uh, i mean uh, all of these uh, uh, all of these i mean these two statements can be uh, uh, executed in parallel because there is no data dependence for uh, across the values of i but uh, we can also see that there is no data dependence data dependence across these two statements so these two statements uh, since they access uh, different uh, regions of memory these can also be done in parallel so uh, so at the best we can have order 2 and virtual processes instead of just order n virtual processes and our analysis should be able to exploit this so uh, so what we do in our analysis that each three a c statement we think which is a three uh, each three address code statement which uh, which uh, is with, uh, which uh, i mean by uh, which i mean is each static access which which we have uh, we have been calling a statement is analyzed se separately for maximum parallelism um uh, yeah so uh, there's no data dependency here that's why we can uh, execute these in parallel yeah so uh, moving on to lecture 142 uh, now we we'll look at the space partition constraint so now as we said earlier we need to analyze these uh, each each statement separately for maximum parallelization so we say that for each statement s uh, now that statement s uh, obviously it would be an access and it uh, it would be associated with an iteration space so uh, we need to map the iteration space to the processor space where the dimensionality of the processor space is k and we do we do this mapping by an affine affine function uh, where the affine function is represented by uh, two uh, matrices and vectors Uh, the coefficient matrix c and the uh, uh, vector uh, capital c and the vector small c and we say uh, that it, it is an affine function of the iteration space so th that means that uh, if uh, i have a, a, a iteration vector i and it it satisfies and it is a part of the iteration space which means that the uh, i plus c is greater than equal to 0 then uh, if i have these uh, if i have the uh, mapping affine function uh, if i have the capital c uh, capital c and small c then i can uh, calculate c i plus c to uh, get a processor id uh, so and that will be part of the processor space uh, now uh, potentially for these statement these uh, capital c and small c values could be different uh, and uh, we could have another variation that we could have a piece wise affine function instead of a simple affine function so what could what a piece wise affine function would do is that uh, it would define a separate affine function for uh, for separate ranges of the iteration space for separate regions of the iteration space so we could have that as well and we can uh, solve or compute these piece wise affine functions using polyhedral analysis which could give us potentially uh, better results than the uh, a, a simple uh, affine function 
a, a simple affine function but uh, the there's a trade off of uh, performance versus cost i mean uh, we could have a more nuanced analysis but uh, it could uh, it, it could be it could be more costly to uh, compute so that's why we will restrict ourselves to affine functions uh, yeah and uh, uh, we need to find a solution to capital c comma small c which satisfies the data dependency constraint uh, uh, so a trivial solution would be uh, that the uh, c matrix is all zero and the uh, c vector is also i mean it's it's a simple a single value and the c uh, matrix is uh, a vector with all zero values so this represents a zero dimensional processor space and that means that everything is mapped to the same processor here it, the same processor means the processor zero and uh, now this will satisfy the data dependence constraint it satisfies the, uh, the partition constraint that we want uh, and this is a valid solution but it is not a very useful one because uh, it won't have any parallel i mean if i uh, assign all the iteration to the same processor then that processor would have to sequentially execute all the iteration so uh, that's why i mean uh, essentially the program is unchanged it was same as before and uh, uh, we don't have any uh, we don't get any benefits from it so uh, that's why we need to maximize the processor space dimension or max we want to maximize the rank of the matrix t uh, and uh, now uh, i defined a fine partition uh, so let's say i have all of the statements that i want to analyze Uh, then uh, uh, a C, capital C comma small C solution for each statement S represents an affine partition. So it is basically a list of all the uh, capital C comma small C solutions, uh, one for each state. Uh, yeah. So uh, now we'll define the uh, what uh, are the space uh, partition constraints that we want. So uh, for any two statements S one and S two, and uh, they could be potentially uh, same statements, and uh, Each statement is a static access which is uh, defined by a four tuple, capital F one comma small f one, defining the access. Uh, 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 I mean the memory access it is doing, and uh, capital B one comma small b one uh, it uh, start uh, it uh, denotes the iteration space. Uh, and same for the statement S two. Then the uh, the partitions capital C one comma small c one, uh, the solution for S one, the and the partition uh, uh, capital C two comma small c two the Solution for S two, uh, it should satisfy this property that for all the for all the iteration vectors i one in the iteration, uh, I mean for all the uh, iteration vectors i one uh, in Z to the power d one, where d one is the uh, uh, depth of the, I mean the depth at which S one is, and for all the iteration vectors i two at at uh, I mean at uh, depth d two. If i one and i two uh, satisfy the respective uh, iteration space constraints, and the, uh, they access the same memory location, which is uh, denoted by this constraint as we have seen before, uh, f one i one plus a small f one equals f two i two plus small f two, and so basically uh, we want to say that whenever there is a data dependent, and there is one more condition that uh, if one of the uh, accesses is a right, at least one of the accesses is a right. Then uh, what uh, of what a uh, uh, fine partition should satisfy that uh, capital C one I one plus C uh, small C one equals capital C two I two plus small C two. That means that a uh, uh, a fine uh, partition should map these iterations which have a dependency to the same processor. Uh, now uh, we map these uh, iterations to the same processor because we want to avoid data dependence violations. Because if we map them to different processors, then I may have uh, data dependence violations. Because uh, I mean, I do not know any order of uh, of these inst instructions getting executed, and I I want synchronization to be parallel. So uh, that's why we want to map all the dependent uh, data dependent iterations to the same process. Uh, and here the unknowns are uh, these. Uh, Matrices and these vectors, capital C one, small C one, and the capital C two, small C two. And uh, I mean, so these iteration vectors i one and i two are not uh, unknowns because uh, we have a for all clause over them. Uh, so uh, this is how the space would look like. Uh, so let's say I have iteration. Uh, I have two uh, statements, uh, two static accesses, and uh, each of them has their own iteration space, s one and s two. Uh, these are the statements. 
and uh, i map the, these iteration spaces to the processor spaces uh, using uh, these uh, affine functions uh, capital p from a small p and, and uh, so uh, and uh, we represent uh, so in this diagram these red lines represent that these uh, points in the iteration spaces have uh, a data dependency in them so what we want to ensure that these points uh, uh, are mapped to the same processor eventually. Uh, and uh, data dependence could be across the same statement or it could be across different statements. So as in this example, we have data dependence uh, across the same statement S1 as well uh, and across the same statement uh, S2 as well. And we have data dependence across S1 and S2. Uh, so, uh, and we want to choose these unknowns as the constraints are satisfied and the ranks are maximum. Uh, yeah. So uh, moving on to lecture 143. Uh, so uh, it's about maximum rank affine partition, which you want to find. Uh, so uh, affine partitions help help us to argue about the processors, iterations, and da the data in a homogeneous way. Uh, because I mean, the uh, iteration space was uh, expressed uh, as an affine function of the uh, iteration variable and the data uh, that we are accessing are also a fine access so that so that's why we, uh, uh, it, uh, we so it's better to uh, express the uh, processor space and the uh, processors also as the affine functions of the iterations because so that we can keep our analysis homogeneous and as we discussed uh, the trivial solution assigns uh, all the zero values to these uh, affine functions uh, but uh, sadly, there's no uh, parallelism in, in this assignment as we uh, as we saw before because uh, they are all mapped to the same processor, the one single processor. Uh, yeah, so that's why we want to uh, maximize the number of points in the range of the uh, uh, of this affine function, and we also we want to maximize the dimension of these focus uh, and uh, uh, correspondingly on the other side we could. Uh, have a max rank solution in which uh, this capital C1 is the identity matrix, uh, which means that uh, it, it's a full rank matrix. Uh, and uh, that means that uh, if, let's say, uh, if D is the loop nest depth, and uh, that means that the dimensionality of the processor space is also D. Uh, and uh, I mean, uh, this is uh, desirable. I mean, that, that means that each point in the iteration space is mapped to a uh, Unique or separate processor. Uh, with, I mean, this is desirable because we'll have uh, a large number of virtual processors and we can execute the iterations in parallel. Uh, but uh, I mean, uh, this may uh, not always satisfy data dependency constraints. Uh, and so that's, so that's why we are interested in the max time solution satisfying the data dependency. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, as we saw before, uh, so we just modifying the uh, constraint uh, max uh, constraints to uh, include the max rank, the uh, maximum rank constraint. So if we have k statements s1, s2, till sk, and we'll so we'll choose these uh, unknowns, uh, these affine functions for each statement uh, of maximum rank such that for every pair of statements s a and s b, uh, where s a and s b could be the same statement. Uh, so uh, so for all. Uh, Iteration for all iteration uh, variables in their respective iteration spaces. Uh, if they access the same uh, memory location, uh, then uh, they uh, they should be mapped to the same uh, processor uh, by the respective uh, uh, affine uh, mapping function. Yes. Yeah. So uh, we'll take this uh, space uh, space partition the partitioning example. So this would be a running example in our uh, in the next module, so we have uh, we have two nested for loops, uh, and uh, i and j both go from one to hundred, uh, and we have these two accesses uh, x i j equals x i j plus y i minus one j, and y i j equals y i j plus x i comma j minus one. So here we have six six statements, uh, one for each static access, and uh, two of them are right. So for data dependencies, as we know that one of them should be a right uh, at least. So, uh, so these are the possible uh, data dependencies that I'll have. So, for, uh, for first one is x i j uh, has a dependency with x i j. Now, this uh, this has basically two dependencies. X i j has a dependency with itself, uh, 
so uh, uh, i mean uh, what i'm saying is that uh, xij uh, it's a uh, uh, is the same starting axis that i'm referring to and the second dependency would be that xij this uh, right axis has a dependency with the xij uh, the read axis so uh, this is one data uh, the, uh, these constitute two data dependencies then the third data dependency is that uh, xij uh, could uh, access the same memory location as xi comma j minus 1 and one of them is a right uh, now same uh, in the same way as i argued for x uh, i can argue for y that uh, y ij could have the, uh, uh, a data dependency with itself uh, in a in a different iteration or it could have a, dip, a data dependency with, with this read access of y ij uh, uh, so this has uh, this constitutes two data dependencies and uh, the last data dependency is that y ij could have uh, the same it could, it could access the same memory location as by i minus n comma j so uh, now we look at these uh, data dependencies and see what constraints that we get uh, so uh, i mean ideally uh, so since there are six accesses we could uh, we could try to solve for six uh, a fine function so six uh, pairs of uh, the, the uh, capital t and small c value so uh, but uh, as we see we can actually reduce that so uh, so uh, so the first dependency where uh, we were checking that uh, x i j uh, should uh, would have a dependency with itself now now we don't we won't have any space partitioning here because uh, i i j is a full rank access and uh, for two uh, separate iteration vectors uh, to act, i mean so for for the for data dependence uh, uh, so for the data dependence uh, uh, for conditions, we had a condition that uh, if we are uh, uh, referring to the same axis, then the iteration vector should not be same. So uh, that means that uh, uh, so it, uh, I can have so uh, if I want to check for data dependence, that means that if I have two iteration vectors i and i prime, I, I, I'll say that okay i equals i prime, and at the same time, at the same time, I will say that i is not equal to i prime because they are it uh, they refer to the same static axis. So, which is a contradiction. I won't have any uh, uh, any data dependency for x i j with itself. So, Jay, another simple way. I mean, actually, all this kind of reasoning I'm just using to simplify the discussion. In a real setting, you know, what a compiler would typically can do to simplify the compiler logic is to actually run the space partitioning constraints on x i j with itself. And when you do that, then what you are going to get is that whenever i comma j is the same as i prime comma j prime, then they map to the same processor. Now that is yeah. trivially true because if i comma j and i prime comma j prime are identical, then they will obviously because it's a many to one it's function. Yeah. Right? So it will always map to the same processor. So I mean, we don't have to use any special reasoning here about i not being i comma j not being equal to i prime comma j prime or anything like that we don't need to do that if we just apply our space partitioning constraints we will actually get the same solution just that yeah. in the lecture i don't want to spend time on these trivial solutions because they can be seen easily right that's all yeah but i mean we don't need to do any special reasoning here i just want to make sure that that's clear yeah okay thanks uh and uh, uh so that's what the cases with x i j when we are checking with uh, dependency with itself uh, then the other dependency where uh, one one x i j access was a right and the other one was a read uh, we do have a data dependency between this access and this static access uh, but it's in the same iteration so it's a scalar dependency uh, so that's why what we do is that uh, i mean uh, in our discussion for the discussion purposes that uh, we'll have one uh, uh, so uh, we'll have one that a fun uh, one affine function for uh, one for each c statement so what uh, i mean by uh, c statement i mean uh, this whole statement x i j equals x i j plus y i minus one j and similarly second statement so uh, i'll have uh, a affine function capital c one comma small c one for uh, for this statement and the second function uh, capital c two comma small c two for the second statement uh, yes so uh, now we'll take a look at the uh, iteration space. So since it was a 2D space, we could uh, plot it very easily. So uh, so let's say i was on the x-axis and j was on the uh, y-axis. Uh, 
So, uh, and when we actually uh, see the uh, data dependency between the site regions, so uh, another uh, extra thing that we have in this site uh, is in this iteration space for us is that uh, we are representing each statement. Uh, I mean, so the statement S1 and S2 uh, each have uh, are represented by a, a different uh, point in the uh, iteration space. So, uh, a clauses are rep uh, representing the statement S1, and the uh, uh, and these uh, circles are representing the uh, statement uh, S2. So, uh, so what we have here is, uh, so for when we consider the first axis, which is the uh, first data dependency, so I mean, uh, uh, so these these data dependencies uh, do not give uh, anything meaningful. So we'll only focus on these two data dependencies in our example for now. Uh, so the first data dependency, uh, 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 when we, uh, apply the data dependency constraints and uh, find the condition uh, for uh, on the iteration variable such that they access the same variable we find that uh, if i have two iteration variables uh, in, uh, i j and i prime and uh, j prime uh, what i get is that i should be equal to i prime and uh, uh, if i have uh, two iteration variables i and uh, two iteration vectors I and uh, so for for when I calculate the uh, data depend uh, uh, conditions, what I get is that I should be equal to I prime and J should be equal to J prime minus one. And uh, but the thing with that is that uh, X I J is uh, a, is an axis of the statement S one, while X uh, uh, I comma J minus one is an axis of the statement S two. Which is represented as follows. So, uh, so that's why we have this dependency that uh, one comma one, for example, uh, and for, for the circle is depend. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm taking one example. Yeah. So the uh, one comma one of the clause is dependent on the circle of uh, uh, one comma two. Yes. So uh, that's why uh, in the same way we can form uh, such. Uh, by taking the second uh, uh, dependency also in, into account, and that will result in, in these diagonal chains. So, uh, so in the end, we get these uh, disjoint chains in the iteration space. And what we could do is that we could map each of these chains to a separate processor because all of these chains are independent. And then we won't, and, and in this case, we won't violate any data dependency constraint because uh, we. We are already uh, mapping all the uh, uh, data dependent iterations to the uh, same process. So we need to find uh, values of these uh, affine, uh, 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 we need to find such affine functions so that each chain is mapped to the uh, same process. And the, right now, the answer uh, we, uh, is that we have a 1D mapping for these statements, uh, which means that the dimensionality of the processor space uh, is 1. And uh, the first uh, function is so i minus j minus 1 for s1 and for s2 is i minus j and it could be roughly seen that uh, since uh, our chains are roughly at a 45 degree angle uh, uh, we, uh, we could i mean roughly say that uh, i mean we could uh, intuitively see that uh, these are the correct mappings and when we actually uh, 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 check whether depend uh, uh, the dependent iterations are getting mapped to the same process they indeed are getting mapped to the same process so all of our data dependency constraints are actually satisfied with this uh, assigned function. So, uh, so uh, now uh, lecture one forty four. Uh, it was on space partition constraints, and uh, it was uh, uh, it was an example uh, to how to find these uh, uh, these uh, constraints, uh, these assigned functions actually. So. Uh, so we'll take the same example. Uh, we had two dependencies there. X i j has a dependency with x i comma j minus one. Let's uh, this was the first dependency, and the second dependency was that y i minus one comma j was had a dependency with y i j. So what we could do is that uh, since we had a uh, uh, depth two loopness, so what we know is that at max the uh, uh, max possible rank of these what of these uh, of which these matrices capital C one capital capital C two would be two. So that's why. Uh, uh, what we get if we if we want the most general solution is that we have a square matrix of two plus two, uh, 
and uh, where the column represents the loop depth which is uh, two and the zo which is the uh, dimension of the processor space which are we are assuming to be two for now i mean if it was less than that uh, the uh, solution should come um, it should note that uh, but for now we we'll use our previous knowledge that the dimensionality of the processor space was one uh, as we say as we saw the solution in the previous uh, module so that means that uh, if we uh, assume the form of capital c and capital c2 they'll have dependent row one row would be dependent on the other uh, so for now we'll assume that uh, the uh, so these values are zero and we will simplify our problem for now uh, so a new problem is this that uh, now the dimensionality of the processor space is one so it's a one cross two matrix and uh, uh, we just have one value in the small c1 and small c2 vectors so uh, so what we are looking at is we uh, basically want a solution where rank of c1 is one and which is the same as rank of c2 uh, so for for dependency one uh, now we'll try to satisfy the uh, dependency constraints and get values of get the values of these values so for uh, for the dependency one if we apply this uh, part uh, space part partition and dependency constraints so what we have is that uh, these are the uh, iteration space uh, constraints uh, for for both the iteration vectors and these uh, so this is the uh, data dependency constraint and we know that one of them is a right uh, so that does not need to be checked here so uh, then what we'll have is that uh, these iterations if they satisfy these conditions uh, then they'll have to be mapped to the same process so one possible solution for this could be that uh, uh, as we can see that uh, i is equals to i prime what we could uh, try to do is that uh, uh, set the coefficient of uh, j and j prime equals equal to 0 so one possible solution could be that c11 equal c21 equals 1 and uh, all the other values are zero so what it this will do that uh, it, it will map an iteration ij to the processor i uh, now here all the conditions are satisfied but this is not the only constraint only dependency constraint that we have to satisfy so if we look take a look at the second dependency constraint uh, so again these are the iteration space constraints and these are the uh, uh, data dependence constraint that they have this uh, they access the same memory locations then uh, 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 this should hold that they should be mapped to the same processor and now this is with respect to the second dependency now i could as the same way as i did for the previous one i could have a similar solution for this one uh, now this solution satisfies uh, this second dependency but it does not satisfy the previous dependency and the previous solution does not satisfy this dependency so we need a solution that satisfies both the constraints and not just one of the constraints so uh, uh, one of the so the solution the solution that satisfies both of the uh, constraints is uh, is the solution that c uh, one one equals c two one equals one and I mean these are the values that we have and uh, so so this is the first defined function i minus j minus one uh, which we saw that this was c one and uh, this is the function c two. And if two iteration uh, two iteration vectors i j and i prime from a j prime access the same memory location and they are data dependent, then they should satisfy this constraint that we have. Right? They, that they should be mapped to the same thing. And this condition actually holds for both of the constraints as well, and that can be verified. And uh, now uh, we'll take a look at uh, lecture 145 now where we briefly discuss on how could we potentially uh, come up with an algorithm for solving these uh, space partition constraints so as we can see so these are the two same two constraints that we got from both of the dependencies these are the uh, iteration space constraints and these are the data dependence constraints and these just say that they are mapped to the same process uh, now both of these constraints must be satisfied. If there were more constraints, then all of them sh should have been satisfied. Then, uh, as discussed earlier, that i j i prime and j prime are not unknowns uh, because we have a for all quantifier on them. So, uh, on so what first we'll do is that we'll use Gaussian elimination to get rid of some variables. Uh, 
uh, and how we could do is that we could use the constraints to eliminate i prime and j prime. So uh, we could just uh, use uh, we could just substitute the value of i prime and j prime using these constraints we have here, and we could get uh, uh, new uh, 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 equations with less number of variables. Uh, now what we have here is that we'll rewrite these equations uh, uh, by uh, by making the RSS zero and uh, taking all the uh, matrices to the left hand side. Uh, and now what we have is that we should hold for all values of i and j in the iteration space. So right now the iteration space is that they should hold for all values uh, from 1 to 100. But what we'll do here is that we will over approximate and say that, that these should hold for all values uh, for all real values. So we'll over approximate uh, by saying that they should have for all i j belong to r. And if we say that that uh, if, if such a thing has to be satisfied, then it is clear that the coefficient of these variables and the constant coefficient has to be zero. So that's why we equate this to zero, we equate this to zero, and we equate this term to zero. Similarly, in the second constraint, we equate these terms to zero. And now we uh, get new uh, some new equations and now we have eliminated i and j completely so that's a, a good thing so uh, yeah so that that's a, uh, that's where my slides uh, were not safe so I'll just write what the equations were so from the first constraint we got the equation that c11 should be equal to c21 and uh, c12 equals c22 and uh, we got c1 equal to c2 plus c22 and from the second constraint, we got these same two conditions again, but we got a third condition which was uh, which we which was not there before that c1 should be equal to c2 minus c21. Now we could use any Gaussian solver to uh, I mean solve these constraints, but uh, I mean if we if we look carefully, then uh, these two equations imply that c22 equal to minus c21 and these equations collectively imply that uh, minus c12 equal to minus c22 c11 equal to c21 and let's say it is a some constant c uh, and uh, and we have uh, and we rewrite the second equation in terms of c now what we could do is that uh, uh, we, now we have to pick a value of c because uh, as the constant values don't actually matter. So let's say the values of C1 and C2 don't actually matter because they just shift the uh, processor space by some constant offset. So um, it does not matter to us. So without loss of generality, we'll just assume that uh, capital C was equal to one uh, and uh, C2 was equal to zero. So in that case, we uh, get a solution that we got previously that uh, the first affine function was I minus J minus one and the second was I minus J. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, as we saw before, that this function actually maps all the data dependence iterations to the same process. So, so no or data dependence uh, constraint is violated. Uh, yeah, and uh, so there's another thing that we have to look for that uh, now it, for the iteration spaces, uh, uh, we have made sure that uh, all the data dependence have, have been taken care of across the same statement and across different statements as well. Now, uh, once we have mapped all the iteration to the same processor, we have to make sure that the that that assigned processor for an iteration, let's say IJ, actually uh, uh, preserves all the relative order of those iterations in the original program, so that we actually don't uh, violate uh, data dependence. Yeah. So that's. It. So thank you very much, Jay, for uh, for that nice summary on uh, I would say difficult topic. So yeah, um, let's open the floor for questions. So I mean, <clears throat> yeah, question, Jay. Yeah, so uh, so as we saw in the module that uh, uh, we actually want to uh, start, uh, I mean, uh, want an analysis to have different affine functions for each of the statement tests. And each statement is a static access. And uh, 
uh, and each C statement could have uh, you know different accesses in the same statement. So it would have it would have one write access and it would have more uh, read accesses in the same statement. So and in the example that we uh, discussed, we actually what we said that we would have the same affine function for each all the accesses in the same statement. So is there any example where we uh, where we could you know benefit or where we would need that uh, same static accesses in the same C statement? would be a different uh, affine function. Okay, sure. So the question is that, is there an example where a C statement is broken down into multiple three address code statements? And, and it so happens that each of those three address code statements can be mapped to different processors. And yet uh, the transformation preserves the meaning of the program. Um, So I mean, first of all, you know, if there are data dependencies between the three address code statements, then they ought to be mapped to the same processor. Right? And if this is if in the in the scenario that you have just explained, uh, there are data dependencies because there are these static data dependencies that you can figure out from the program or the logic itself. Uh, just in case, I mean, I can construct an example uh, like um, uh, let's say that. Um, you know, the two accesses were on the right hand side, RHS of the C statement. So let's say XIJ plus XI minus 1J on the RHS. And, um, you know, it's, and so now if they are not really, I mean, they can be independently computed and then they need to be summed into some third thing. And now, yeah, I mean, you know, I'm making up an example here, really. Uh, but, but I mean, so and and one of them was basically a constant, let's say, you know, so I could do, for example, I could use the same, like, let's say it was x00 or something like that. So it was xij plus x00, and then I could treat them separately and then kind of hoist one of them up uh, effectively. Or, you know, one was a one dimensional access, the other was a two dimensional access. So one of them can be hoisted above into the outer loop or things like that. So, yeah, I mean, I would say it should be possible. Yeah, because I'm just thinking um, more about this. So, uh, yeah, I think this example yeah. AIJ equals BIJ equals some constant, right? So then we could, this is one C statement. Sure. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, it's enough. just a contrived example, but. Yeah, it's a contrived example, sure. But I mean, there's also kind of some more real examples, right? Like if I say XIJ plus YI. In a single state C statement, and it's a two dimensional loop depth. Then I treat them separately, and then I can say that, oh, YI can be actually be uh, moved outside uh, using this analysis. Um, some kind of loop invariant code motion kind of thing here yeah, that can come as a result of this analysis, I guess. Uh, I'll have to think more about this, but yeah, perhaps there is some, uh, some you know, I can construct as an example. Yeah, let me think more about this and, and get back to you. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, incredibly quiet class today, but uh, yeah, let me just summarize you know what what we have learned uh, in this week last week we basically saw an example where we said that oh look you know this code can be transformed into that code and it was looking almost magical uh, how that this code can be transformed into that code i mean it looked very difficult to reason uh, manually that this such a transformation can be done although when you verify it you'll find that it's a legal transformation and how how can an automatic algorithm do this transformation? And I think this is this this whole idea of doing space partition constraints uh, is a is a very uh, very nice algorithm, which captures a lot of these common patterns that can be exploited. Uh, the 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 cons so what are space partitioning constraints? You have an iteration space. You want 
to parallelize the iteration space. So, you know, one thing is you can run each iteration on a separate processor, uh, but you know, that's not going to satisfy your data dependence constraints necessarily. So you basically say you want to have some function such that the some unknown function f such that these data dependence constraints are satisfied. What is this uh, unknown function f? If I just use a free form function, then the problem becomes super difficult. So I make my problem simpler by saying this unknown function f is an affine function. Moreover, I say that the processor space is a k dimensional processor space. So that gives you know a fine function on a one dimensional would once again limit me on what I can do. But a fine function on a k dimensional processor space actually uh, keeps the nice structure of a fine uh, polyhedral framework intact, yet gives me a lot of flexibility because there are k dimensions in the processor space. Right. Uh, so, so that's what uh, you know. So, in so, if we just use this framework, it turns out that many uh, parallelization opportunities can be exploited, like in the example that we just saw, and we're going to see many more examples in the coming lecture modules. Um, how do we find these affine functions? So, the first thing about an affine function is that it can be abstracted. It can be represented using a small number of constants, which is basically the multiplier constant and the additive constant. Right? In the case of n dimensions, the multiplier constant is an array, a matrix, and uh, k, uh, to be more precise, it's an n cross k matrix where n is the number of, uh, uh, is the group depth and k is the number of processor space that I'm going to ex expecting. k is going to be less than or equal to n, so in the most general case, it's an n cross n matrix. And then you have n size vector, which is the additive vector. And now the, your job is to find these unknowns. So how do you find these unknowns such that the data dependence constraints are satisfied? So the most important, I think, slide that uh, Jay showed was that there is this mathematical formulation which says that if the data dependent, if there is a data dependency, then the function should map the two iterations to the same processor. Now, if there is a data dependency, we uh, we already know how to represent that using uh, in you know using some kind of uh, affine constraints that can be later translated using integer linear programming solver that can be solved using an integer linear programming solver. So we already saw that last time. So if there is a data dependency, we know how to exp express that. Then the function should map to the same processor. So once again, because we have restricted the function to be an affine function. The, the constraint that they should map to the same processor can also be represented as an affine expression. So now we have this, uh, we have two affine expressions. The only problem here is that there's an if and a then, and there's a for all, right? So for all cases where this condition is satisfied, which is there is a data dependence, then it should happen. So we have, we don't yet know how to kind of reason about these for all, Conditions like for all cases where this is true, then that should be true. You know, the ILP solver or anything like that doesn't give us that capability that for all cases where this is true, then that should be true. How do I reason about these things? So we're going to, I mean, that's going to be the discussion. I mean, we're going to go into the mathematical formulation of how that can be saw, reasoned about in the next week. But in this week, we basically looked at an example to see how for this particular example, we could do this reasoning. So we said, okay, you know, in this particular example, whenever there is a data dependency, so I write down the data dependence constraints, then it must be true. Uh, then I write down the uh, mapping to the same processor constraints. And now I have these two equations. For uh, these two equations, what I do is because I mean I'm only interested in the cases where uh, the data dependence constraints must be true. So I can use Gaussian elimination to firstly reduce the number of variables. I can, for example, get rid of the prime variables like i prime is i plus one and j prime is j or something like that. And, and based on that, you know, I can kind of simplify my mapping to the same processor constraint because earlier my mapping to the same processor had, let's say, four different variables, i, j, i prime, j prime. Now I will have only two variables, i and j, because I've eliminated i prime and j prime using the if then the for all condition. So that's the only case we're interested in. So that's step number one. I hope that was easy to see right and then uh, the step now now i have a now i have a uh, saying that you know for all possible i comma j 
whenever it is in the iteration space, then they should map into the same. Then this constraint should be true, which is just about i comma j. And now I just kind of, you know, the word j uses over approximate, which is basically that, you know, I just say that, okay, I'd forget about what the constraints, iteration space constraints are. I just say it should be true for all i comma j. If it's true for all i comma j, it's obviously true for i comma j that belong to that iteration space. So I just kind of say, let's find, try to find a solution for all i comma j. Firstly, I mean, at every step, one trivial solution that's always true here is zero. Right. So, I mean, so when I'm over approximating, it's not like over approximation is coming for free. When I'm saying that let's over approximate from just considering the iteration space to considering all possible real numbers, it's not coming for free because at that point uh, I may be losing down, losing out on the optimality. I could have over approximated even further. I could have said, oh, you know, let's just say that uh, it's true for all possible ij and uh, it's possible it's true for all possible ij and i prime j prime i don't even substitute if i say that then uh, the only solution that comes out is basically everything is zero but after i've substituted and then i say over approximate then the solution that comes out is going to be a better solution than zero a, a higher rank solution by better i mean a higher rank solution for the affine function all right and now basically my question is okay so now you know if I kind of over approximate in this way, then I, because this should be true for all i comma j, the only way it can be true for all i comma j is that the coefficients themselves are zero. And then I just get a nice bunch of equations on the coefficients themselves. Now i comma j are completely eliminated. i prime j prime have been completely eliminated. The for all has been completely eliminated. And I know that if these constraints are true, then my original constraints would be satisfied. And now I just solve for these constraints. And when I solve for those constraints, I mean, uh, you know, I don't really care about um, the additive constant because it doesn't matter. Like it can be plus 100, minus 100. It's just a processor number. I have to give a name to the processor. It could be start from zero. It could start from 100. It doesn't matter. I also uh, don't care about the multiplicative constant for the entire matrix. I mean, I care about the relative things, but I can just multiply the whole matrix by another seed. The rank doesn't change. And so based on that, I get a solution. Right? So I just choose some constant, let's say one for the multiplicative and zero for the additive or something like that. And then I get a constant that I get a solution. And uh, you can check now with this that that solution is going to satisfy my original space partition constraints. The stuff that we haven't discussed so far is once we have solved the space partitioning constraints, how do we generate the code? One one interesting kind of uh, property that we'll have to maintain while we generate the code is that uh, you know the relative order of the program statements uh, should remain the same. If if the two program statements, th two three address code statements, map to the same processor, then they must be having a data dependency first of all, and uh, and so their their order should be preserved because if you change the order, then the program's meaning changes. So we, that, that's that's the code generation problems. We haven't talked about that yet at all. So that's uh, one thing you know we should we should keep at the back of our mind. We, we're going to talk about it of course later, and it's also an interesting problem. But for now, we're just interested in sol solving for this affine function, and uh, and we've seen how the solution can be obtained for a particular example. Next week, we're going to see how the solution can be uh, uh, obtained for a more general example. Okay. Um, so there are no questions. Um, let's see a show of hands, maybe. Okay, Nitin. Yeah. Hi. Good morning, everyone. So just one one clarification. Uh, while uh, uh, this program transformation is happening, this is a static transformation, and we are only transforming the code so that it will follow an access pattern. At the execution time, the data layout is still doesn't change, right? Yes, data layout right? does not change. So yes. now the now the question is, if the data layout doesn't change, uh, only the access pattern is changed. Uh, will there be any other blocking factors at the runtime? Because we are going to generate addresses in a different pattern than what the original program was supposed to uh, generate. Sure. Right. Will and also we are going to generate access patterns uh, 
or access addresses from different processes. Assuming there is only one, uh, there is only one RAM and maybe uh, one common cache. How uh, how the parallelism actually is going to improve the performance? That was my. Uh, are there any any other other constraints which are which we are not talking about at this time? That's the point. Okay, so so I mean, of course, we have abstracted the problem here completely by saying that we are interested in maximizing parallelism. Right, and and we haven't really talked about other kind of metrics of interest. Uh, there could be cache usage or something like that, or memory level parallelism. Or something. We're just interested in kind of spreading these iterations across as many processes as possible. I mean, that's how we have mathematically modeled the problem. And now, once we solve for that problem, we basically kind of you know get a solution which is the maximum possible under the constraints that it's an affine function and under the over approximation that I just discussed. Right, so under all those constraints, we get a maximum. Um, an optimal solution for that. And now, you know, we have to work, one thing that we've already seen is typically maximizing parallelism also maximizes locality. Because what happens is that when you maximize parallelism, then data dependent stuff basically comes together on the same processor. And now, you know, if the outer loop is basically a parallel loop, even if you execute it on a sequential machine, then what you have done is that the outer loop is basically about all the data independent stuff and the inner loop is basically all about all the data dependent stuff. And so what you've done is you have decreased the reuse distance typically. So that's one great thing that we had actually discussed last uh, time that when you when you optimize for parallelism, you're typically also optimizing for locality. So that's a good thing. Of course, we have changed the access pattern, as you said, but typically, I mean, if you, uh, if, if you just run the whole program on a single processor, you're actually getting better locality. So the access pattern is actually good access pattern. It's not a bad access pattern if you actually do it. So that's a good thing. Uh, if you spread it across multiple machine uh, processors, I mean, right now we are saying you can, we just want maximum number of processors. And on a real machine, that actually may cause a lot of cache coherence traffic or uh, some kind of, maybe not cache coherence because here we are basically talking about a completely independent, uh, uh, data independent iterations that are getting farmed out. But there could be other uh, issues which are, you know, which are related to the architectures. Uh, uh, Behavior because you, what can happen is that a lot of processors are actually accessing in parallel and there was a common cache. Then the cache can start thrashing, right? Because there's more kind of footprint now as opposed to a single processor that's happened. And so all those kinds of issues are there. Of course, we have not been. Now these are. We, I mean, those are like. So this is the way we basically structure the compiler pipeline, right? We first basically give you assume that there are virtual infinite number of virtual processors and we kind of parallelize as much as possible. And then we let some kind of uh, later stage, which is a scheduler basically, decide you know, which virtual processor goes on what thing. So for example, you know, the scheduler can decide that you know, uh, there are only 10 processors and uh, these, these the first 100 virtual processors go to the first processor, the second one go to the second, or it can do some other kind of scheduling. And when it's doing that scheduling, it can take into account all these kind of hardware constraints. But at this level, we are not really worried about it. At this level, we are interested in maximizing the number of virtual processes, and that's all, right? So that the scheduler has the maximum flexibility later on. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Uh, Sayam. Um, hi, uh, you mentioned in the 145th slide that uh, we take the multiplicative constant to be uh, one without loss of generality. Uh, but in general, if we have multiple statements in a uh, loop, uh, shouldn't we uh, try to maximize the opportunity of parallelism by trying to map them to different processes? So shouldn't the multiplicative constant be akin to something like the number of statements? See, I mean, uh, firstly, like if you multiply all the elements of a matrix with the same mul any multiplied by 10, it doesn't really change the rank of the matrix. It doesn't really change the range. If you, if you take that matrix and multiply with an iteration space, it doesn't really change the range of that function. Right? It just, I mean, so if the original uh, range of the function was, let's say, 0, 0 and 1, 1, the new range will be 0, 0 and 10, 10. Right, makes sense. So if I just you know, multiply all the elements in the matrix with the same constant, it doesn't really mean, make any difference whatsoever. But for multiple statements, we had a discussion earlier, which was that, okay, um, 
what we could have done here was that uh, because there are multiple statements, you know, when we use that C11 uh, kind of thing, uh, then we could have said that, okay, uh, let's have an extra row. So, you know, we started with a matrix which, which had n cross n uh, unknowns in our space partitioning constraints formulation. Now, because we have, we want to account for an extra, uh, extra dimension, which is the different statements, we could have an extra row in the matrix. Of unknowns, and so that would be an n cross n plus one kind n plus one uh, kind of matrix, right? I mean, and then I could have in the vector I would have a one also, so it would be an n plus one cross n plus one matrix. Make sense? Yeah, we could do. Yeah. So okay. if you put n, so to, to take care of this fact that you have different statements, and uh, you want to map different statements to different things, different processors. You could increase uh, the dimension of the vector space by one by just adding one at the end and then having one extra row and one extra column. And that way you would be able to solve and kind of increase the rank even further. Yeah. That's an excellent question. Yeah. Thank you for that question. I hope that answers your question though. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so, uh, so I was thinking that the iteration space that we have, so that was just uh, z to the power d, so that's uh, a vector space. But like, if we just if we are taking an affine function on this, so so will will that function's range be a vector space? I mean, like, how can we talk about it? Uh, its dimension. So, I mean, apart from the fact that we constrained it to be integers as opposed to real numbers, mm. right? I mean, if you multiply, so if you have a if you have a vector space of n dimensions and you multiply it with a with a matrix of a k cross n, k rows and n columns, then you get mm. the vector space of k. Uh, but 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 adding something that uh, because in linear transformation we'll just have that multiplicative. Thing, right, but uh, but since we are dealing with affine transformations, so we also have that additional plus c naught constant, so that would not make it a vector. I mean, maybe I'm just overthinking. No, I think okay. I think see the the additive constant here makes makes a difference because we are uh, we are dealing with finite spaces. When we talk when in linear algebra, we are talking about the infinite space, right? The real mm -hmm. space, or something like that. Here we're talking about finite spaces because it's a bounded iteration space. And so pl the plus basically makes a difference. So yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I won't, like, I, I use the idea of vector spaces just to kind of, you know, fall back on linear algebra theory and that kind of stuff. But uh, I'm not sure I can kind of, you know, really kind of mathematically say that these are vector spaces or anything like that. Not, the, yeah, I mean, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, and I, yeah, I, it's not like I'm a big expert on this linear algebra vector spaces. I mean, it's a long time I studied, so it's not like I mean, I, I, I maybe there's a better answer that I, I'm not being able to provide here. But uh, overall, I mean, it's an approximation. It's not really a, you know, it's not a real, real, uh, it's not a real number, real valued space. It's a, it's an integer space with bounded. Thing. I mean, we're just using linear algebra theory to kind of deal with these polyhedral things, but it's not really uh, the same kind of. It's not completely the same thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Pankaj. So that, uh, there was uh, like uh, one assumption we did, like we uh, removed the last row. So in uh, while we are doing like spa uh, space partitioning, so in the coefficient matrix we removed the last row. So uh, like as you said, right? If we include the last row, still we'll get the same solution. But um, I just wanted to uh, ask, like, what would be the assumption to uh, remove that last row? Simplification is there, but. Uh, 
if like we want to reason about Azam. I just removed the last row because to simplify the discussion. Okay. I mean, okay. real compiler should not remove the last row. I mean, okay. Why would you have extra logic? I mean, when the <laughs> when the same formulation will automatically give you, remove it, right? Why should I, I? Why should I spend programmer effort to basically you know do these kind of things? You know, so the, okay. yeah, some of the things I'm just simplifying for discussion. Not it doesn't mean that the compiler actually does the simplification. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. So I, I just want to uh, you know uh, complete my answer to Sayam's question, which is that if you have different statements, then and we want to map them to different um, processors. Let's say you know let's say there were n iterations, and there were two statements, then you want to map them to two n processors, right? And I guess Sayam was thinking that you know I can just multiply the whole thing with two, and then I'll get two n processors. But that's not really true. If you multiply the whole matrix by two, you still get n processors. Just every processor's num number is just inflated by two. You only get even numbered processors. That's pretty much it, right? So to get two n processors, what you do is that you have yet another variable in that uh, in that i j iteration space. You have yet another variable. Let's call that statement id. So is it statement ID one or statement ID two? And and that statement ID can have like you know two or three or four or whatever is the different range range of your statement ID values. So for statement ID one it'll be one, for statement ID two it'll be two, for example. And then uh, and then in the unknowns which are the C capital C and the small C, we will have those unknowns for that. So I mean, should depending on the statement ID, I should cho choose a different processor or not? That will now just Come through directly from your space partitioning constraints. You just add an extra row uh, in my capital C, right? Um, and also like an extra column. It comes in n plus one cross n plus one, because it basically it's also like as though you are adding one extra um, dimension to your iteration space, which I which and whose range is pretty small. I mean, so whose range is basically based on what is the statement ID. Right. So maybe there are five statements and it goes from one to five. And then you just say, OK, now, I mean, should the processor ID depend on the statement ID or not? So everything else remains the same, just the number of unknowns increase. And you solve for them and uh, you look for the maximum rank solution. And if those statements were uh, data independent, then the maximum rank solution that you would obtain would actually map those different statements to different processors. And you you would get your two n answer immediately, okay? So that's how that you know. Uh, so that's that's how you would get that. But if you just multiply the whole thing by two, you're not going to get that. Okay, I'm glad we discussed this. Yes, uh, it's it's an interesting point and also brings clarity to the whole setup. I think. Okay, uh, can I have a show of? Okay, let's uh, let's stop recording here, and uh, we can have some informal chat after that. <laughs>